Uh, on the 12th day of May, me. 12 podcast players. 11 horrible segues. 10 puns of punning. Nine coleslaws eating. Yeah, it's not funny anymore. Eight lifelines throwing. Seven interviews running. Six people whining about fees. Five amazing neighbors. Hey, wait a minute, Richie. Five should be just one amazing neighbor. I think you got another typo, man. Four trips to Bavaria. Did we tell you Joe went to Bavaria? Three trips to the Canadian Rockies. Joe told you he came to the Rockies, right? Two trips to Asia. I'm sure Joe told you all the Southeast Asia trips, right? Wow. He's got to stop that. I'm going to barf. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Duggan. Let's rent out your ears for the next hour to talk medium-term rental properties, because today, to show you how that might be your best real estate play, we welcome Ziona McIntyre. Plus, fans wanted to throw down Benjamins on Taylor Swift tickets recently and got shut out. In our headlines, we'll look at how tickets are sold and scammed with the help of a guy who's managed Grammy-nominated bands, Randy Nichols. For our TikTok Minute, we'll show you how to help your baby nail an 800 credit score, even if getting food in their mouth still poses a challenge. Choo-choo! Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Brian, who has an incredible voice, and questions about his inflamed probate. Maybe he should have that looked at, huh? And now, two guys who will help you stack Benjamins in the short, medium, and long term. It's Joe. Oh, and oh, J-J-J-J-G. Happy Monday, stackers. I'm so happy you're here with us. Welcome to some fantastic money conversations. We've got, uh, man, there's going to be a lot of takeaways today. And a lot of them are going to come from the guy sitting across the card table from me, Mr. OG. How are you, man? No pressure, I guess. No. Hey, the bar is high, pal. You show up at the card table in mom's basement and the bar is high. It looks like a low bar, but it's pretty high. Yeah. Good weekend. You have a good weekend? Yeah. Some uh, breakfast with Santa on Sunday, which is, uh, you know, pretty much the uh, greatest thing to do in the history of mankind. Santa! With all the children everywhere. Did you ask him for a Red Rider BB gun with a snack a snap action? What what was the thing? The snap action? Uh, no, I didn't. You did not? Mm-mm. I asked him no. to uh, prevent me from getting whatever disease these children all carried. <laughs> you, you already failed at that one for 2022. So right. maybe he's got to do a better job in 2023. We got a fantastic show today. We've got uh, Ziona McIntyre talking about real estate. It's been a while, OG, since we talked about real estate. I mean, a few weeks ago, we talked about REITs and some of the problems around non-traded REITs and things that all of our stacker community should watch out for. But if you're somebody buying real estate, individual properties, she's going to talk about medium-term rentals. You ever consider in your real estate empire, OG, buying medium-term rentals? No. Yeah, she's gonna make a she's gonna make a good case for it today. Let's hear it because a lot of people, you know, it's either Airbnb, mm-hmm. right? On one end, we Airbnb quick rentals, or we just go a year at a time, or two years, or whatever it might be. Should buy like at a kind of lodge. That's what we should buy. That's that's yeah. You should buy the uh, what the the suites, the extended stay extended suites. stay America. Yes, or you're there for like thirty days. Yeah, exactly. She's gonna make a great case for that today. But before that, we have a, uh, wow, a guy who manages Grammy-nominated bands, uh, Randy Nichols, talking about the Taylor Swift. What, what's the last time you tried to go to a concert, OG? Um, it's been a really long time. But you've gone to musicals and shows and uh, still, you see that Ticketmaster fee? Does that, does that drive you crazy? I got tickets for a football game a couple of weeks ago, and the fee to buy them was... Forty percent of the ticket cost, oh, which oh, was effing holy, insanely stupid. Wow, 
Wow. Yeah. And then the, on the disclosure thing, I think that there's probably going to be a lawsuit on this because there's no disclosure on that. It's just, it's just like, you know, the tickets are $400 and you're like, okay, I need four of them. All right, cool. That's uh, 1600 bucks, but whatever. And then they're like, that'll be 2,600. And you're like, wait, what? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It was a t- you know, the fee, the, the management fee to do this. It's funny you say that Randy is OG going to talk about how this latest Taylor Swift thing maybe put a bunch of people over the edge. We'll talk about exactly what happened there and how people... Um, Remember the good old days where you used to like wait in line at Ticketmaster? Right. You'd get up on Saturday and you'd wait in line. And then if you were smart, you'd space your buddies out because then I don't know how your Ticketmaster did it, but ours would come down the line and give everybody a ticket, everybody yeah. a number. And you yeah. have a number and they go, all right, uh... 116. And that became the number one. And then everybody routed behind that person. Yeah. So it didn't really matter. It was, it just made it so you didn't, didn't matter what time you got. You didn't have to get there at 4 a.m., you know, to line up. Or well, yeah. Something. Cause they changed that game. Remember that it, it was midnight. People would line up all night long and they'd open up specially for just an hour, whatever it took to get rid of the line at midnight and became a thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And then when they started selling online, it, it was called a convenience fee. That they one of those things they would add in. Yeah, it's convenient. But, right. For- but now we don't even have a choice. I have a good buddy who went to see one of Elton John's final concerts when it came near his house. I think it was about 45 minutes away. And he wanted a, a paper ticket like as a souvenir. He was taking his whole family and he wanted them to have that. He he had to drive all the way to the venue, to the stadium, to get a paper <laughs> ticket. And they looked at him like, uh, Who are you? I don't even know. Yeah, can we? I'm not sure we can do that. Like, they had no idea how to even do it. They finally figured it out, but he had to go there. Uh, it, it couldn't even, there was no like Ticketmaster office nearby. Remember when they were just kind of scattered sure, throughout yeah. it? Yeah. Get them at the store. Yeah. So they're still charging us the convenience fee, but there is no other way to get really the tickets. And on that same note, as it relates to the paper thing, we went uh, on a trip a couple of weeks ago and flew. Uh, what is it called when you fly with a whole bunch of other people? Coach. Oh, yeah, commercial. Anyway, <laughs> anyways, we had bags. And so we had to like give them to the people to take our bags, and put them on the plane. And then they gave us printed tickets. And I was like, do I need these? And she's like, well, they, yeah, I mean, they're your tickets. And I'm like, right. But I also have my phone, just like everyone else for the last 10 years. Can I just use the phone ones? She's like, oh, I just thought you wanted the paper ones. I'm like, why would you think that? Have you noticed that? Joe, you've traveled a little bit that and you, you check your bags. They give you a paper ticket. Like, yeah. Why? Why? Like, what am I going to do with this? I have no idea what to do with this. We'll see how worked up we got about that, guys. That's how worked up the, <laughs> the world is going to be when they hear Randy Nichols kind of pull the pull the curtain back on what's really going on. Deona McIntyre here talking medium term rentals. Randy Nichols talking outrageous ticket fees. So let's go. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. I had a nice long conversation with Randy last week, guys, and uh, we will post the entire discussion. If you really want to, (laughs) if you really want to have your blood boil, go watch the whole thing on our YouTube channel. But let's post some of the clips here for people that don't know what the heck we're talking about. Let's dive in for a second. Randy explained to all of us uh, exactly what happened here with Taylor Swift. I think most people know they've tried to buy a ticket on Ticketmaster at some point in their life and been like, man, this Ticketmaster thing is evil. Everything about it is messed up. There's scalpers on here getting the tickets before me. These bots that are buying tickets ahead of them and they can't get them because it's sold out. And there's just problem after problem that people face. I was a kid once upon a time waiting outside of a Ticketmaster outlet before we even did this online. Right. And I was interested in the problems then too. Like I I was, you know, the 18 year old kid standing outside and tickets went on sale at 9 a.m. But the guy inside didn't open up the door till 9, 10. And when I came in, the printer was just printing. Tickets are coming out. But then like two people come in and he tells me the show sold out. I know. Like, something's I, not yes. right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, there's clearly. So, I've there's been th- watching this my whole life. Just on the Taylor Swift tour, she took a lot of tactics to try to prevent scalpers and bots and all these other problems. And, you know, you also have the supply and demand concept for this, which I'm sure all sure. your listeners are quite aware of. <laughs> right. And Taylor Swift had 50 dates. Figure each date has an average of around 
50,000 tickets available. And this pre-sale had, I think, about 3 million people sign up to want to get tickets. People are getting two tickets or four tickets. So immediately, you have more demand than supply. So you have a problem instantly. Then on the Taylor Swift scenario, you had these bots that were able to figure out how to go around some of these Ticketmaster systems to slow down these fans who got these codes to get in and in events. Now, obviously, with Taylor Swift then, it was, hey, there's a lot of demand. I mean, OG, Taylor Swift could just fill seats forever. So the Taylor Swift thing, truly not the big deal people thought it was. Just the world crashed the system. There were too many people and too many bots. But when I asked him then, when he talked about the bots just then, I asked him about the bots. Here's what he had to say. There's a group of major ticket brokers, as they like to call themselves. Like basically the term scalper has changed over the years as they've hired lobbyists and branding experts, and they are now ticket brokers. And they are out there using both technology and relationships to acquire tickets. And there's, there's two ways that they're using these bots. One is on the front end where they are accessing these on sales um, as quickly as they can. They could act as like a thousand people at one time wow. to access a site. So however they program these things, and you could run multiple box, it's incredibly cheap to do. The FTC has only enforced one company ever with this bots act that was um, signed in, I believe, 2018 or so. So there's a very low risk of using them. And they go out there and they use different credit cards and different names to acquire groups of tickets. But the other way that bots are used is incredibly interesting. It's something that very few people know and that they're looking at is for like smaller, less in demand club shows, they have sniffer software that they run through Ticketmaster and it searches for shows that are almost sold out. So you could talk to someone who works in a box office in a venue of, you know, your local club that has like a thousand or two thousand capacity and they'll search. And when those shows hit 200 remaining tickets for, you know, a show that has about like one to two thousand people, they immediately send their bot out to buy all those tickets. And I talk to promoters all the time. They tell me, oh, we just hit the 200 limit mark and all the tickets went. And they now run these things, they call them bot reports. And they look through to figure out of that last tranche of tickets, where they went and who bought them. And they'll often cancel those tickets, even though it'll take the show from not sold out to sold out to allow real fans to get them because they're just using the software to go, okay, this isn't, you know, Taylor Swift. This may be, you know, the band I manage under oath who typically sells out like the week of the show. And now they can hawk the tickets the last week at a significant increase because it's the only way to get them. This is amazing. This is, I feel like we're talking about Randy. Remember the old movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy? Like where they're cornering oh, yeah. the orange market? These guys are cornering, trying to corner the market on your favorite band is what you're essentially saying. Market gets close to cornered. I, I buy the last 200. I jack up the price. You got to buy from me. You're not going to buy it from anybody else. Everybody else who's in there is a fan. So that seems bad, but here's the big one. Doug, you and I talk about indie bands all the time, bands that don't have a huge following. In fact, there was a band called yeah. the Cactus Blossoms that I, ah, I was right. playing for you last week. It sounds such a 50 sound that those guys have. But when you follow some of these indie bands, this is when scalping gets really, well, just listen. Some of the tactics that artists have taken, like Taylor Swift created this verified fan program which you had to prove you were a fan. They ran some algorithms on you to prove that you're a fan, and that put you to the front of the line to buy tickets for her tour. And for the most part, that system worked. The problem that they had, though, was that these bots were entering the system at the same time, which shut down their system and crashed their system. The, the best way I could describe this is you look at you know, a denial-of-service attack that hackers will use where, you know, they'll send a million people or perceived people to a website and the website goes down. Yeah. This is basically what happened to Ticketmaster. They're prepared to sell the number of tickets for the number of people that are there. Then they're prepared for a bot attack of maybe a couple of million 
you know, alleged people there on top of who they expect to be there. But in this scenario, they had, I want to say like 15 or 20 million people, you know, or attempts to access these tickets. And it shut down the system at one point. They were able to get it going again rather quickly. And part of the process that they did, which had a lot of fans upset too, is I kind of use this term that it was slow ticketing. You know how shows usually sell out, you know, show goes on sale, it's sold out 30 seconds later and yeah. people are angry. Yeah. They use this process where they built these queue systems and they were ensuring that people were real before they bought them. So people were upset that it might have taken them five hours to go through this queue system while they were making sure the people were legit. And at the same time, they're taking like oncoming fire from the outside from these bots that are trying to take down their system. I thought that was good advice, but it seems like so far, guys, you know, Ticketmaster, he hasn't pointed out that Ticketmaster's the bad guy. Like I've always thought, and you and I, we, the three of us, we were talking about Ticketmaster being the bad guy. Here's what he had to say about, about that. Ticketmaster is paid to be the bad guy. It is part of their job to be the bad guy. So those service fees that we all hate. I've hated these since those, the 90s, right? Yeah, and I've always hated them. In the early days when Ticketmaster decided to become a company and get started, there was the main ticketing company called Ticketron, which some people who are in their 50s may remember that name. Ticketmaster came along to compete with them, and Ticketron's business model was a venue would pay them for the service to help them sell their tickets. So Ticketron was getting paid like a dollar a ticket from Madison Square Garden, say. And Ticketmaster came along and said, hey, Madison Square Garden, we'll pay you a dollar a ticket for the right to sell your tickets. But the way we're going to do this is I'm going to take a dollar and you're going to take a dollar and we're going to create a service fee that the fan pays for instead of you. And it completely flipped the script. And the cost of ticketing went from a cost to a revenue stream. Wow. And then over time, these fees, as we all know, went up and got higher and higher. But the venue was always getting a really good cut. And sometimes it was the promoter. And where you'll hear the ticket scalpers talk about this, in more recent times, there's some managers who are able to negotiate to get their artist part of that fee. So there's all these people with their hand in the Ticketmaster fee and Ticketmaster's role is to be the bad guy and just have everyone mad at them because the fan is not Ticketmaster's customer. The venue is Ticketmaster's customer. Ticketmaster has a contract with the venue that they have to uphold to offer a product to the fan. How about that, huh? The last hundred tickets. So the key is to be number 101. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you actually said that, OG, because I asked him, I'm like, okay, this is, to me, this is super interesting knowing what's going on, but what can we really do about it? Here's what he had to say. Biggest takeaway is pay attention. Look at these pre-sales that a lot of artists offer. There's a lot of opportunity to get tickets early. There's typically, you know, Live Nation pre-sale, an AEG pre-sale, an Amex pre-sale, like every different credit card company. Do your research Find where there's these pre-sales. The secondary market you know, players will tell you they're evil. They're actually opportunities for you to get in early. And use Google. It's your friend or you know, can be your friend. It can do a lot of other things too. But search and find these passwords for these um, pre-sales. And it's, it's a way to get in early and get your tickets. That's, that's the best advice I could give you. The other advice I would say is... As much as you want that ticket, maybe wait till next time. These scalpers and crazy fees, they don't always sell a ticket they actually have. There's a whole arbitrage game where they will offer you a ticket at a much higher price, assuming they're going to find it cheaper and then sell you a ticket they don't own. You're getting played if you buy one immediately after you find out the show sold out. So my best advice on that front would be wait until the week of the show These scalpers are typically holding more tickets than they can deal with. And there's an opportunity in the days right before the show where the market drops. And you can often get tickets to a show that's sold out or below face value just before the show. I know the business we need to start. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So I'll sell tickets to the podcast. Joe, you be the venue. Yes. Doug, you be the, I don't know, the ticket master person. The poor schlep trying to buy a ticket. 
Yes, actually, that's even better. How did I know you were going to say that? <laughs> We've got all three functions here. It's fantastic. It's like the face value is $59, but after fees, it will be $259. And then me and Joe will split the 200 It's perfect. It'll, it's a win-win. Well, you know how people say win-win, and everybody, that became a thing, talking about win-win, but then some idiot called it win-win-win, and everybody rolled their eyes. I think they roll their eyes, OG, because there is no such thing as win, win, win. It's win, win, lose. And that's yes. what we're presenting here. I pick win. I pick win. I got second. Uh, you're screwed. Oh. What's left for me? Doug takes the lose. <laughs> Sorry, Dougie. Big thanks to Randy Nichols for joining us. Uh, great advice. If you're thinking about going to a concert, get in early. I think that's our takeaway. But I feel a little better, you know, knowing what's going on behind the scenes there. He also gets into, by the way, how on the YouTube video, guys, he gets into how Garth Brooks is just trolling these bots and these ticket companies and uh, what, what he's doing that a lot of artists are not. Hmm. Hey, let's do our TikTok minute, guys. This is the part of the show where we shine a light on a TikTok creator who's either doing something brilliant to help you with your money or doing something I roll brilliant to help help you with your money. Oh, gee, is this one brilliant or is it brilliant? It's definitely eye roll brilliant. Everything on TikTok is. This is your rich BFF on uh, TikTok. This one actually, though, is an Instagram reel. She's there too. We'll link to her in the show notes, but let's hear what she has for us today. People help their kids get perfect credit scores long before those kiddos can apply for their own credit card. And it's not even that complicated. I can explain it to you. As soon as my kid is born, I'm going to set them up as an authorized user on my credit card. As you can see, with the exception of Discover and American Express, most of these credit card issuers don't have a minimum age requirement. This means I will be issued a credit card with their name on it, but I'll be responsible for paying the bill. And you're probably wondering, what does a baby need a credit card for? They don't. Instead of giving the card to them, I'm either going to cut it or I'm just going to put it in a safe location. I will then proceed to make on-time payments on my credit card bill every single month. By doing so, I'll start building good credit for my kid, allowing them to leech onto my good credit. By the time they finish high school, they'll have built a credit history of 18 years and have a score in the high 700s or even 800s. This will help them rent their first apartment or qualify for a great credit card of their own. There it is. You know, a lot of kids have trouble with that first credit card with establishing credit. What do you think about that strategy, OG? I think it's insanely stupid and unnecessary at every level. Could you be more clear, please? I know, I know. We're sitting here looking across the table and, uh, okay, continue. What's, what's it, to what end? I mean, is this a, a pervasive issue that 18-year-olds are unable to get credit cards or 18-year-olds are unable to get uh, property? They can't rent a house? I, I, I've i never, ever, ever heard of an 18-year-old who can't get a credit card. They freaking hand them out like cotton candy at school. They They have no limits for the levels that Discover Card and Amex and all these other places will go to rope you into getting a credit card. You don't need to have a good credit score at all. And secondly, have you seen there be significant issues in like trying to get apartments? I know, Doug, you're going to say, well, you know, big cities or something, there's some issues. Well, I get that. Like if you have, um, you know, you're just out of college and you're moving to a big city and now you've got a rent that's three grand a month and you just got your first paycheck for five grand a month, the landlord's going to have an issue. But you need to manage that a little bit better on your own. Find a cheaper place. I I, I just don't know. I haven't, I, I don't drive down the road and see a whole bunch of 18 year olds going, well, I'd love to have an apartment, but I guess I'll live here on the street instead. You know, it's just not a thing. It's unnecessary. There's other stuff that can go wrong. Like what happens if you decide to, I don't know, miss a payment? What happens if you fall into trouble? You got 20 years. You're responsible for your kid's credit history. You, what if you get laid off from work? Now you screwed up their credit just as bad as yours. I Thanks, think that serves Dad. the kid right. Hey, kid, you leashed yeah. onto my credit. You're going down with me. Yeah. And, and think of it this way. What if you need to like use their credit? You know, they're like 15 and you need to open a card in their name. You know, like how are you supposed to? That's a joke. Nobody's laughing. <laughs> weren't there wasn't there a story about that that you know somebody did that to their 12 yes. year old wait no there was you mean i'm not supposed to do that and ran their kids credit into debt or something like that no we had a guest on where dad was opening up all kinds of credit cards in in the kid's name and just wrecking their credit 
Can can you see that though? Holding that over juniors, you go clean your room, or I am wrecking your credit I will, score. I will. I will. I'm so help me God. I will not pay this visa bill, and you will see your FICO score. Yes, it will crater one late payment, and I'll tell you, you will see a five hundred. Let's see. Let's see you get your apartment then. So, so that all this is going on your permanent record. That's a real thing. It's a real oh, thing. Even worse than the permanent record, your Capital One record. Yeah. This is going to go on. <laughs> you do not want fidelity coming after you at the end of this. Yeah. Magnify Money's about to hear about this. So I get that it could work. This also works if you wait until they're responsible. Because if you add somebody to an as an authorized user to your credit card, in some cases, some companies are a little different. They will not only share your credit history moving forward, they will also share your history that you've built on that card up to that point. So there's some cases you have to kind of Google this to see which companies do this. But there's a number of examples where you can kind of leech onto it in that in that regard as well, if that were a thing. But I just don't see how this is a necessary, you know, a necessary risk or a necessary thing to do. Now you have to keep track of your kids credit reports. You have to, I mean, there's social security numbers all over the place now. I don't know. I mean, how many emails do you get from Discover that say, or Citibank or, you know, whomever that say, oh, yeah, sorry, uh, our shit was broken into again. <laughs> yeah. Free credit monitoring for you. Hey, uh, sorry My that bad. the hackers have all your stuff. My bad. It's like, now you got to deal with your like two-year-old who's yeah. social is out in the interweb. Anyways, I, I, I think it's an unnecessary thing to do. So... I roll. Yeah, we'll dive more into the Ticketmaster situation, of course, into establishing good credit. Let's talk about good credit for yourself today in the 201. We have a free newsletter. We call it the 201 because we try to keep it 101 here on the show. Then if you want to dive deeper, we give you our free twice a week newsletter, the 201. Uh, Stackofbenjamins.com slash 201 gets you to the newsletter. Hey, coming up next, uh, Ziona McIntyre is just amazing. Uh, every time I've met this woman, you just come away with this enthusiasm and and love of rental properties. I'm a guy that no longer does uh, rental properties. I talk to Ziona and I always think, I got to get back in this. Yeah. Because what I love about Ziona too, OG, she doesn't do it the way that everybody talks about, right? Find a Find a house that's trash and fix it up. Ziona McIntyre does not like to fix things up. She does not like to roll paint. She does not like to hire contractors. She's the opposite of all the people that I feel like we always talk about in real estate, and yet she's made it work. She made it work to a big degree. Listen to this from 50,000 in debt to financially free in two years uh, using Airbnb back in the early days. And now she's all about medium term rentals. Her new book is called The 30 Day Stay. The Investor's Guide to Mastering the Medium-Term Rental. We're going to dive into it with her here in a second. But Doug, before we get there, I think you've got some trivia for us. Darn right, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And on this day in 1980, Apple had its IPO. And man, was it a honey crisp. I know we're about to talk to Ziona McIntyre about medium-term rentals, but I think it's safe to say Apple was a long-term hold. They sold 4.6 million shares at $22 a share. And I'll pause here so you can go have a good cry. So my question is, Apple was the first company to surpass what valuation? I'll be back right after I look for the missing part of my time machine. Hey there, stackers. I'm Marty McCry and Doc Frown, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. The initial public offering of Apple generated more capital than Biff getting his hands on that Gray's Sports Almanac, and more capital than any IPO since Ford Motors way back in 1956. The stock made 300 millionaires that day, and I'm so sad to report, I was not among them. Steve Jobs made 217 million and still didn't include me in his will. The stock had increased 32% by the end of the day, and the company was worth about $1.8 billion. So they weren't the first to a billion, but what was the valuation Apple was the first company to hit? A trillion dollars. And now, to help you hit your first trillion with medium-term rentals, Ziona McIntyre. 
And here she is, a woman I've been so excited to meet. Ziana McIntyre's here. How are you? I am so good, and it's just... I'm excited you're excited to meet me. Feels good. <laughs> well, absolutely. And I love this topic because everybody talks about short-term rentals, right? People talk yeah. about being a landlord, but midterm rentals. I want to start off by talking about your story on how you got there. You grew up in a house, it sounds like, from the preface of your book, where you guys really struggled with money. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I grew up in Hawaii, which I think people glamorize. They're like, oh, it's all these fancy resorts and beautiful places to be and expensive restaurants. And it is that. But for a lot of the people that live there, it's a lot of struggle and poverty because those people are living in a very expensive place, but working in the blue collar jobs, right? So my mom was a cleaning lady and my dad sold used cars and they just weren't good with money. Mm. And, but one day your mom, what decided to get good with money? Like she decided that, uh, you and she and this and Susie Orman, were going to spend time together. I mean, I bless her heart. I think my mom never got good with money, but maybe better. I, she had the drive to try to do something else. And I think that stems from being a single mom and, there was, I don't know, probably 10 years that she was driving like 45 minutes each way to commute to her job. Wow. I can't even fathom that now, but she really hustled for us. But is that why financial independence since Yona was so important to you was, was because of that? Yeah. I mean, for me, it was very much like I woke up one day going, I don't think everyone else is struggling. Like, I don't think this is actually normal, even though it's normal for us. And this is what I've only seen from the inside. And so I thought, there's got to be another way. What are other people doing? And that made me kind of pop my head out and look around a little bit. Do you remember, speaking of popping your head out and looking around, yeah. do you remember where you were when you encountered, it sounds like, and this is based on the beginning of your book, it sounds like your first encounter with this big aha was Mr. Money Mustache, right? Was with Pete and Yes. Do you remember where you were and what was going on in your life when you read that? Dude, I do. That's so funny. So I was couch surfing in Ohio, which sounds really odd. Um, but I was dating someone at the time that lived in Ohio. And I remember sitting on this bed uh, that we were staying in this lady's guest room and looking up. I probably was looking up like, I don't know how to be financially independent or something like that. His blog popped up and I started reading it. And luckily, I found him right at the beginning. I think it was 2011 when he got started. And so I just kind of grew with him as he was writing his articles. But it didn't really work for you, though. You wrote that you were making very little money. And he, although he was good inspiration for you, like many people, Ziona, it, it wasn't you weren't going to get there by the same path. You know, I think you're wrong. <laughs> Let's really? talk about that. Yeah. yeah. So the way that it worked for me is that I saw what was possible. And I never thought that someone could retire by 30. And so it just planting that seed in my head, I said, can I do that? I think at the time I was 26. And I'm like, well, I don't have that much time, but let's just put that out there. Like, I'm going to try to do this and I'm not going to be in my own way. I'm going to just say, this is possible. This is my new goal. And I'm going to manifest this. And I don't know how it's going to happen, but that's what I'm working towards. And so I think just knowing that that's an option is so powerful. Yeah, I get that, that it worked for you. Now, obviously, <laughs> obviously, you wouldn't have kept reading if it didn't inspire it. you. But like putting a bunch of money in index funds was not the way you were going to get there. Well, I mean, that was going to take a long time because I think what he had was 600K in index funds and a paid off house. And I was $50,000 in student debt and making, at that time, sitting on the bed, nothing, but later making minimum wage or a little bit above that, right? So I knew how to live frugally. So that's a really important tool, but I didn't know how the money was going to come in. And luckily at that same time, which seemed fully unrelated, but now I wonder, I found Airbnb. I started talking to a friend about this new concept that was actually very similar to couch surfing. So it was easy for me to kind of take that on, understand it. So how did you then make the leap? So shortly after Ohio, I moved to Boulder, Colorado. I'm in massage school and I'm really like thinking I'm going to start a massage like place and I'm going to have people doing massage under me and I'll have this whole business. And that's how I'm going to leverage to get to this financial independence. Right. That's what I thought. And then my friend tells me about Airbnb and he's living in New York. 
He just got laid off. He's got this really expensive apartment and he thought, hey, I heard about this Airbnb thing. I am totally burnt out. I want to go travel. I'm going to just try to rent out my apartment and just see what happens. And this was something he didn't own, you know, so he was just subletting. And this is back in 2011. And so he kind of kept being persistent with me and saying, oh my God, this is so great. You need to do this. And I just, it felt so far away from what I was doing. I was on this track. I was in college. I was doing massage. I'm going to do this thing. So it felt like a distraction. But after a year, so 2012, he comes back to me and says, I made $50,000 off this apartment that I did not own. And that at the time was like a $100,000 salary. You know, it just felt like a really big thing that I'd never touched in my life. And so I said, okay, I'm here. I'm going to do it (laughs) finally a year later after you annoyed the crap out of me. And so that's when I started doing it. I just remember in my head when I first approached real estate too, had you owned real estate before? Because to me, real estate seemed hard. Like being a landlord seemed hard. Yeah, that was one of the ventures I kind of went into with my mom before she passed away is that we kind of got, I don't know, tricked or scammed into one of those big things where you you go to a webinar one day and then oh, uh, no. they have you buy like $40,000. Luckily, we kind of got out of it. But it was one of those, I think it's Dean Graziosi or somebody that is teaching you how to be like a guru real estate investor. And so we tried to wholesale a little bit. I don't know. We tried a couple of things, but that never really worked out. And those dots just never connected in my mind at the time. But somehow this Airbnb thing seemed so easy. So at the time I lived in a two bedroom apartment, it was already furnished with all my stuff. I had a roommate that was living in the other bedroom and she had been paying me a little bit more because it was furnished. So I already kind of had this idea of like, how can I leverage to make a little bit more? So when she moved out, it was really easy for me to say, let me just put it on Airbnb and see what happens because I've already got the furniture, the sheets, the towels, like it's not costing me anything else. And if it doesn't work, I'll just go get a roommate. So that's kind of how I started. Wow. And so let's dive into your first, your first purchase and how that actually went. Okay. So my first purchase was actually two years later. So I spent two years living between different Airbnb apartments that I was renting. And now they call that arbitrage. So if people want to look up that concept, but I really don't like arbitrage because I think you need to own the properties to have it make something for you, right? Our Mm. wealth and real estate is built over time with appreciation and equity. But can somebody, can somebody, Siona, can somebody get started that way though? I mean, is that a decent way? Are you sad that you started that way? Because it seems like if you have no capital, right? If you've, and we'll talk about financing later, that this seems like an easy way. Maybe you're not going to make much money, but maybe to get your feet wet. Totally. It's just how some people start with wholesaling and how some people start with flipping is that you just build a little bit of capital. But if you stay there, then you're still the hamster on the wheel. You have to make Uh, a deal for money to come in. And if you go and take this active earned income and then put it into passive investments like real estate or index funds, then they're making money for you, right? So that's the difference is that you need to have sort of this new place that the money's going to go to. Gotcha. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to, oh, to, to make sure that was a, this there was your a, show, a man. point there. <laughs> hey, <laughs> we're going to do what I want. No, but anyway, y- you were saying. Yeah. So what worked out really well for me to buy my first place, because this is super scary. That concept is usually super scary for people. The first place, even the second place is this hurdle of like, what am I doing? Am I going to blow everything I've saved for this whole time into yeah. this investment? Yeah. So I like Airbnb because I think it's real estate training wheels. So what worked well for me is I had a one bedroom apartment five minutes away from this place that was a one bedroom apartment that I was going to buy. Right. And so the one bedroom apartment that I had been renting, I had been renting a year and a half. So I'd already seen all the seasons and I was paying eleven hundred a month there and I was making uh, 1700 to 4000 a month based on whatever month it was because the seasonality changes. And so I knew, okay, this is going to be pretty cookie cutter, this exact same place that my mortgage and HOA together is going to be like 950 That's going to do the same numbers. And so it was really easy for me to say, okay, I feel comfortable with this because it's actually cheaper than what I've been paying in rent. Gotcha. So your first purchase was actually fairly easy, it sounds like, and pretty straightforward. 
Yeah. Well, I was really motivated. So yeah, that worked out. Actually, at the time, my mom was passing away and mm. I felt like I needed to have a steady, safe home for her because I had been living between two apartments and just kind of any place that booked, I would just pick up and leave. I literally had just a packed suitcase for two years and that was my hustle. So I was able to become financially independent in two years by hustling. Other people won't want to do that or, you know, they'll take a little bit longer, but it's just kind of how comfortable do you need to be? Yeah. How did you get started in mid? Because I can't imagine that you started with midterm rentals or did you start with midterm I rentals? I didn't. No, since I started in 2012, like the regulations for Airbnb didn't come in until maybe 2017. And then they started enforcing them more 2018 or so um, in my town. So where I live in Boulder. So it just wasn't a problem. But after things start changing, then you have to pivot, right? That's the important thing as real estate investors. If you're going to be creative, you've got to be able to switch with the times. Uh, when you talk about regulations, explain to us exactly what you mean by Airbnb regulations in town. Because I think a lot of people just starting out don't even realize this is a big thing. Yeah. So short-term rentals, they just, there's just a lot of towns. I, I think it's the hotel lobbying, but you know, whatever towns are saying it's taking away affordable housing. And so they regulate it by saying you have to rent 30 days or more. Some towns let you rent it out uh, short-term under 30 days if it's your personal residence. So we do that where we live. I'm, I'm actually home right now, which is rare. But um, yeah, we are here probably six months of the year because we have to be here at least six months. And then the other six months, we pet sit, we travel, and we rent out our house short-term. Got you. Okay. And so the deal is you need to be there also. Your tenant needs to be there longer than, what, 30 days? If it's not short term. Yeah. So in Boulder, if it's not your personal residence, then yes, it has to be 30 days or more. Gotcha. Do you do any short term rentals now? I do just in different markets. So I do the one that we live in. We have, I have, let's just talk about mine. I have one in Colorado Springs that got grandfathered in. And so now they're not allowing it as much. And then I have one in Washington state near, um, near the sound. So it's kind of like a little cabin. Gotcha. Oh, that's cool. That sounds like a great place. Yeah, it is. Why, why are those, why do you stick with short-term rentals there when really the rest of your empire is midterm rentals? Yeah, well, it's because legality. So it's just started changing so much that so many places are changing the regulations. So a lot of places that I did have short-term rentals, now I do medium-term or I do a hybrid where people will do short-term in the high season. And then in that slower time, because everything's seasonal in, in these kind of furnished rentals, during the slower time, people will get in the longer term tenants for a month or three months. And the reason being is that if you leave it up for short term rental, you might book every other weekend, but that's just a couple hundred bucks and that won't even cover your mortgage, right? So it's better to get someone in for the whole month, even at like a slightly cheaper rate. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I would imagine yeah. that in some months, vacancies could kill you on the short term game. They can. Yeah. But yeah. what happens is that generally places make money so much in their high season that even if they're vacant, the whole like winter is usually the low season, but it depends. They can make it work. So it depends. Let's dive into, well, before we get to reasons, you, you've got a, a list yeah. of 11 reasons that you love midterm rentals. But before we get to that, you also explain early in the book, Ziona, that you really like the people that do the midterm rentals, right? I mean, these people are generally people that are going to take care of your place, which I think is a really important part of this. Tell me what type of people you end up usually renting to when you do the 30-day rental. Yeah. So number one, we get travel nurses and I love them because they're actually at the hospital the whole time. So, you know, they're not really in my unit that much, uh, which makes them a good tenant and they're gainfully employed and highly background checked. So they end up being great. Then we also have a lot of traveling professionals. So there's kind of this distinction between a digital nomad and a business traveler. And I say a business traveler is someone who comes to town to go to a local office. They might be a traveling scientist or working at the college or whatever, researcher. 
maybe at the local Google, and they're coming in for whatever stint uh, to go into an office, a digital nomad can work from anywhere. And that has been something that has really kicked up since COVID. So previous to COVID, people, there were like 7% of em- employees in the U.S. that were digital nomads. And now it's 40 I think 42%. Wow. wow. Yeah, so it's huge. And even though they're calling some people back to the office, I think a lot of places are continuing to be flexible. So yeah, we we have great tenants through that. There's lots of other things, people that are divorcing, renovating their homes, uh, people that are escaping some kind of natural disaster. So yeah, the tenants list goes on and on. You'd be surprised. Wait, and, and by the way, when you mentioned people renovating their home, I laughed out loud when you said, and this I think is different than most real estate people I've ever talked to. You do not like renovating property. You do not no. like dealing with contractors. Like I that know re- my place. <laughs> that re- <laughs> but that really surprised yeah. me because, you know, most people in real estate, as you know, like to find a place, you know, uncover the bones, redo it so they can get a premium. You don't like doing any of that stuff. No, I think that's God's work. I think people taking something ugly and making it beautiful again is amazing. So bless the flippers. But I talk about the real estate food chain. Like I think there's people that buy a house for a dollar, you know, and it's tear down and they make it to a certain point. And then the next person comes in and they they build it out a little bit more and they sell it for a hundred thousand dollars. And then I can come in and then all I have to do is furnish it. Right. So, yeah. you know, that's my place. I know that really well, but I don't. Yeah, I don't like renovations. But I think that's refreshing to a lot of stackers out there, because I think a lot of people not in real estate, they're afraid of real estate are like. I'm horrible with a hammer. Like there is no way oh, that yeah. I'm going to be able to do this, but you don't, you don't have to, which I thought was super cool. Let's get into these 11. These are 11 reasons you love midterm rentals. Then I want to get in a little bit into okay. financing. Number one, regulations. I think we went over this a little bit, but what do you mean by regulations? So basically once you're over 30 days, you're in this like sweet gray area that people or municipalities are putting you in with long-term rentals. So all of a sudden there's no transient tax. You don't have to get the like same permit. It's just easy. Some places don't even have regulations for long-term. So yeah, it's just sort of like under the radar. Which is number two on your list when you say easy. It is the easy button. I like, yeah, I find it to be a lot easier because in short-term rentals at least, People are learning your house every three or four days. And so they're going to have the same questions every time. And there's just a lot more turnover and expenses. And so for us in this longer term stay, if you don't hear from somebody in the first three days, you're probably not going to hear from them for their month or three month stay. And so it just ends up being quiet. Lovely. Yeah, and, well, which brings up a question with your short term rentals, you must have found a good team of people that are on the ground because you're in a different place than these properties are. So do you have a property manager or do you have a, just a cleaning crew and you manage it yourself? How does that work? Yeah. You just need a cleaner and a handyman. And nowadays there's so many automations that you really don't need much else. So, you know, down the line, if you need a specialty plumber, either your handyman or your real estate agent is going to have those people. So it's just super easy. Number three on your list is fewer expenses. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So with a short-term rental, there's just a lot to bookkeep, I guess. So every time you have a guest, they might have, you might have 10 guests in a month. Each time you're getting paid whatever different amount it is that that guest is paying. And so with a medium-term rental and a long-term rental, you get your same rent every single month. And so you have one payment and then there's all these expenses. So you're covering all the utilities, you're covering all the cleaning fees. So there's just lots of things going out of your account all the time. It's just a lot to keep up with. I find that with the medium term rental, often the people supply their own supplies. So you don't have to replace things too often. We are still paying the utilities, but those are more predictable. So it just ends up being less. Yeah, I can imagine, which brings up Number four, which is fewer transactions. I think that's the same thing. Number five, that might be surprising here, less competition. Yeah. Yes. So in this space, as you look on Airbnb, you'll see that there's a lot of boutique hotels, professional interior designers, just so many people have come into the space and made it really competitive. So to stand out against these people is really hard. 
But in the medium term rental space, if you're looking on Furnish Finder, which is one of the main places we advertise, you'll see that it's a lot of mom and pop places, dreary basements, poorly furnished, and, and poor photos. And so if you just kind of go with our book or, you know, just look at it as a professional in the space, making your places cute and professionally photographed, you're going to be standing out way ahead of the game. Which brings up the next one, which is you set the rate. What do you mean by you set the rate? Yeah. So one thing that I see that's a mistake is that people treat a medium term rental like a long term rental and they say, well, my long term rental is 1100 a month. In the medium term rental, every time your guest leaves, you can change the rate. So you can make it 1150 and then the next time the guest comes or leaves, you say, well, let me just see if I can get 100 bucks more. It only takes one person to say yes, and so you can change it every time. And that's why I still use pricing software because in the high season, I might have a property that's 2500 a month, but in the high season, it'll go for 4000 And I wouldn't know that unless I was using pricing software. Wow. What type of pricing software is out there, Ziona? I use Beyond Pricing, but I would actually recommend Price Labs. Um, and basically, it came from the hotel industry, but it is just a software that's pulling from other Airbnb and Verbo data. And they're saying, okay, this is the most requested times and dates, and this is what we think the rate should be. So it just kind of helps. Gotcha. Number seven, less vacancy. We already talked about that. Number eight, more flexibility. I think we've already landed on that. Number nine, having a guest apartment. What does having a guest apartment mean? Okay. I just think it's awesome. So, you know, we're just adding lots of fun points, but for me, having a guest room is, you know, well and good, but I can say I have two guest apartments in town. So, you know, come and stay in my guest apartment. Oh, I got gotcha. you. I think it's kind of cool. I like yes. that. You know? It's a little flex. It's a little flex. It is. A, it is a flex. My guest apartment's right <laughs> over there. Right? That's right. <laughs> 10 minutes down the road, so you're not in my face. Yeah, I love it. For people not watching the video of this, uh, I just did like a sun's out, guns out kind of thing. Uh, number That's right. number 10, popular and unusual locations, which, by the way, makes total sense to me. I get this one because I'm in Texarkana, Texas, and I know that the medium-term rental with the college up the street and the hotels here that will often have some traveling nurses, like uh, medium-term, I think would totally make sense here, which means, and I'm just extrapolating here, I could pay less for the property potentially than having to be in these you know, a list locations where the short termers really want to be. Yeah. And it just kind of expands people's minds that even if you're in a rural location, people might be wanting to stay somewhere on a retreat for a longer period of time. Or I know uh, a medium term renter guy that does, he's kind of middle of nowhere, California, but he's getting a lot of nurses there and it just works out well for him for really high rates. And so it just kind of depends. Yeah. Yeah, those are actually the last two popular unusual locations and works in inexpensive markets. Let's talk about financing because you have a whole chapter and obviously we're yeah. not going to in three minutes cover that. But if somebody's really worried about how the heck am I going to finance this place, Yona, like everybody buying their first place, it's so difficult. How do we solve the difficulty getting financing question? Well, so it kind of depends on where you are in your life. But if you can, house hacking is the best way. What I mean by house hacking is either buying something with an ADU, like a separate unit or a basement that has its own, you know, walk in, walk out kind of space or even a multi-unit. So you can do one to four unit properties for the same kind of loan structure that you would do for just buying a uh, home. And that works best because you can put very little down. Yeah, nice. And then also... Because you live on the property, you're getting a lower interest rate versus an investment loan. You are. Yeah. Like a whole point less. There are so many. We just, that it's a tip of the iceberg that we just covered here. The book is The 30 Day Stay, A Real Estate Investor's Guide to Mastering the Medium Term Rental. Available, you know, I think everywhere, right? Yes. So it will shortly be on Amazon and otherwise it's at biggerpockets.com slash 30 day stay. Awesome. And if you use my code, you get 10% off, which is just my first name, Ziana. Well, and going with your, and by the way, we will, if you have trouble spelling Ziona, we will 
spell it for you in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Yes. But also, audiobook. Is there going to be an audiobook? Because a lot of us love the there audiobook. Will. Cool. It's coming through Amazon. It is not my voice. No. I am sorry. I'm sorry. That was my next question. I know. I told Bigger Pockets. Everybody just like yell at Bigger Pockets, but they were like, no, we're going to use somebody professional. Sorry. No. So, I'm going to give mistake. a call to Scott Trench right now as soon as we're done. Complain. You do it. I will. Do it right now. See you on a great meeting, you. Thank for helping our stackers yeah. get into medium term rentals. Yeah, have them reach out. I'm happy to help. Hey, this is Lou Mangello from WDW Radio. And now, when I'm not at Walt Disney World or sharing my passion for Disney World or eating, I am stacking Benjamins. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency OG, they put what you, you value first. Um,. I'm getting a, uh, a standing rib roast for Christmas. Um, oh. been watching some videos on that oh. and a potato like, ricer in your stocking. Yes. Like, God, uh, God, I hope so. That would be epic <laughs> for the man who has everything. How about a slab of beef in his stocking? <laughs> it's going to come out with all the lint all over it. Uh, it's dry aged. It's been in there like, cause you know, you know, for mom and dad, the stockings just kind of get filled throughout the season. <laughs> You know, it's like, does it smell like meat in here? Oh, no, this dry aged, sweetheart. <laughs> Why does Christmas smell rancid? All the stockings spread out and a bunch of flies around one of them. <laughs> Just... Yeah, it's, it's dry aging. It's a thing, guys. Check it out. <laughs> Mom, why is this stocking dripping? So I want a potato ricer because I understand that to make <laughs> uh, <so> gross. <laughs> better mashed potatoes. So we're, uh, we're experimenting this Christmas. So that's that's what I'm doing. I feel like we should try it out in advance. Just to make sure that we know how to do yes. it. Yes. Yeah. I think it's uh I think it's podcast guys uh game night. We just bring over some wine. Good time. Yes. You're gonna try it out ahead of time on us. Yeah, OG. Sure. Absolutely. I'm up for that. Game on. Let's Come do on it. Come on over. Yes. Right, well, the last time he asked me over for his standing rib roast, did things did not go like I thought. It was they a whole would. different thing. <laughs> he, Doug had no idea what that euphemism meant. <laughs> I don't even know what it means. Sure sounds funny. It's actually your loved ones in your time. It's why they've <laughs> made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Matt at Haven Life right now is like, you guys are going to do a straight read? Just like read the thing? Head to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote. Love what they're doing at Haven Life because they're committed to offering a modern way to buy life insurance. No waiting several weeks for a decision. <laughs> really lovely customer support, <laughs> affordable prices. Doug is, Doug's gone. And their application is simple and it's all online. Today, today we're going to throw out the lifeline, <laughs> throw out the lifeline to uh, Brian from Wisconsin with an A, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Hey, Brian. Hey, Doug, OG, and Joe. This here is Brian from Wisconsin. So, a question for you. I'm out there hunting pheasant, and I accidentally drop my side-by-side, uh, you know, and, and it hits a twig about as big as your thumb on the way down there, and it must have caught the trigger because a little rascal went off. And nobody got hurt. But my buddy says to me, he says, hey, you better make sure your policy's up to date. You don't want your stuff going to probate. I says to him, oh, you betcha. But don't worry, I got my probate checked out in the doc. Uh, he says I'm good. He took his time and everything, gave it a good thorough check. And he says, if I come back every month, he'll check it for me real good. And my buddy says, he says, no, you goofball probate. Well, I didn't want to insult him. So I says, oh, okay. I thought you said the other thing. I'll get it taken care of. So a few days later, I'm over at the Woodman's Grocery helping a lady get into a parking spot and almost get hit by a Dodge Ram. You know those Ram guys. But I almost died, and I realized I never got my probate checked out. So what's this probate thing got to do with me dying, and why don't I want it? Oh, and uh, I'd really enjoy the T-shirt. Sorry for taking yours there, Doug. Good God, Wisconsin. We f***ing apologize. <laughs> it's just the nicest people in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> they are we love them oh that surprised the hell out of me oh man we should listen to these ahead of time uh oh gee 
It is a good question. Might not be Brian from Wisconsin, but it might be a good question. Let's talk probate for a second, OG. Well, it doesn't sound like any Brian that I know from Wisconsin, but um, what is probate? Probate is what happens when you have to settle in the state. So if you pass away, then the court system has to kind of help figure out how your stuff is going to be divided up, right? You might have a will, for example, it says, I want, you know, half my stuff to go to each one of my kids, or I want the church to benefit in this capacity or something like that. But somebody has to adjudicate that. Someone has to kind of sign off that says, yep, this is what was written down. This is what was done. And we think that this was done based on these wishes. You also will go to probate if you don't have any of those things. So every state has their own rules about how an estate would be divided if somebody passes away without having any documents, without having their own estate plan. The, the, the state has its own estate plan for you. And that's kind of how that process goes as well. And it's really... Um, an invasive process. It's pretty costly from a from an attorney standpoint. If you have to hire an attorney, and uh, and it can kind of get dragged out. You know, it's it can be nine or ten or twelve or fifteen months. I mean, it's it could be a pretty long process. It could be very quick, also depending on how you know on the size. But but all of this is avoided by having an estate plan put together ahead of time. So if you meet with an estate planning attorney, what they'll work to do is get your assets out of probate. So try to make sure that they're that they're titled correctly and that the beneficiaries are correct and that if you need estate planning documents, that those are correct as well so that you can avoid that excess cost and then also that extra extra time uh, dealing with it. And one of the biggest issues, using Wisconsin as an example, there's a lot of people in Wisconsin that own lots of land. The thing about land is that it still requires, you got to pay taxes on it. You still got to have insurance on the house. You still got to have you know, pay the mortgage. And if you have a process that gets dragged out for six months or a year, there's some chance that there's some costs that are accumulating. The bank doesn't care that grandma and grandpa passed away. They they want the, the mortgage paid every month. They want the the county wants the taxes paid. And if there's not a lot of liquidity there, you could run into some issues of like, hey, this thing's taken too long to settle because it's just a backed up process. We can't sell the land fast enough. Now it's in foreclosure because we don't have the money to pay the tax bill. You know what I mean? There's like some domino effects to that. So if you really have anything from an estate standpoint, you want to visit with an estate planning attorney just to make sure that that you can avoid that as much as possible. We're sending Brian a t-shirt, right? I, I think, I don't know, Joe, did you get that thing from, uh, from Gertrude said that we're out of t-shirt codes this week? It's, it sucks. It's horrible. I mean, yeah. fresh out. We'll have them next week or Wednesday. I think, I think she said even by Wednesday. We'll have uh, the coats back. Should so. have a fresh supply. Sorry, Brian. Sorry about that, Brian. Appreciate the call, and um, better luck next time. Well, you just lost him as a listener. We'll live. Hmm. I'm more worried about the half of Wisconsin we lost than losing Brian with that one. StackyBenjamins.com <laughs> slash voicemail if you've got a, a question. And again, we will dive even deeper into probate in our newsletter, the 201. That's going to do it for today. Let's take a quick look at the community calendar, guys, and see what's going on in mom's basement this week. Man, do we have a busy, busy week. Tonight at uh, 4 p.m., Buffy Purcell, who was on the show earlier in the year, you may, you guys may remember, uh, you've got to crawl before you ball, Buffy Purcell, who has been on reality TV on a Bravo series has about one and a half million followers on TikTok, is going to join us on Instagram today as we start kicking off this series that we're going to be running mostly next week about uh, what are the lessons we should have learned from the events of, of 2022. So Buffy Purcell is going to join us. You know, one of my favorite Buffy Purcell phrases, quotes that she said on our show was, OG, she said the most dangerous words you can say to yourself when you're in money trouble, what are the three most dangerous words? Not I, my fault. Well, those are the second. Those are good ones. I think these ones are worse, though. I deserve it. She said when she had money problems, she kept saying, well, I deserve it. I just It's just a treat, just a little treat as she dug a deeper and deeper and deeper hole. Oh, yeah. yeah I like I that. I deserve it is horrible. Buffy's going to have some good stuff today. So join us on Instagram at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern for that coming up on Wednesday, pro bowler. And by that, I don't mean professional bowler. I mean, NFL 
pro bowler, one of the top players in the NFL while he played, Eric Wood, who played for seven years with the Buffalo Bills, uh, joins us to talk about he had to make a big pivot in his life. He's had to have a couple big pivots, and he's going to talk about when life gets you down, how to make the switch. And he's got some great, great advice there. Eric Wood is uh, always a fun guy to talk to. You never think about OG, a guy who's an offensive lineman, specifically a center, as being one of the more articulate guys on the team. No, no offense to O lineman, just not the connection that you make. And wait till you hear Eric, Eric on Wednesday. But if you're not here for reality TV stars or uh, retired football players, you're here because as recession fears ramp up, you may be feeling anxious to make some moves in your finances. What I'd like you to do instead is check out this free guide OG and his team put together that'll help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. It has some great insights on what you should be doing and smart financial questions to ask so that you make financial decisions your future self will thank you for. Head over to stackybenjamins.com slash guide. That's stackybenjamins.com slash guide to get that free guide from OG. All right, that puts a cap on Monday, everybody. Doug, what should we have learned today? Man, there's a lot. Sure thing, Joe. First, take some advice from Ziona McIntyre. Wondering if there's a way to make more from your rental properties? Maybe examine the way you're renting your property. Medium-term rentals might be your answer. Second, hoping to see your favorite band in concert? Buy early, sign up for notifications, join the fan page, and hopefully you can avoid some of the bot ugliness happening in that market. But the big lesson, don't cheap out when you're buying a time machine. I knew I shouldn't have gotten that one I saw in the back of the weekly world news. Thanks to Ziona McIntyre for joining us today. Learn more about her work at zionamcintyre.com, including her new book, 30 Day Stay, The Investor's Guide to Mastering the Midterm Rental. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks also to Randy Nichols for joining us. You'll find more about his management work on his LinkedIn page, which we'll link to in the show notes. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch, with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all The Basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Did you buy a coffee mug?
at Taquamanon Falls. I did. Why? No reason. Because I live in Texas, dude. No, I know. I bought one in, o- in Oregon, too, when I went to, what's it called? I can't pronounce that word. Mon- not my Falls. Menomena. I went to Menomena. Multanoma? Menomena. Falls. Uh, no, I appreciate you helping out our economy. It's good. Beautiful. Buy all the Michigan. We also rode the, um, we also rode those cool canoes. You know, you can take the canoe across to the island. It's, it was super really? cool. I didn't know that was a thing. Oh my God, Dave, there's a stand that's been there forever. Well, I've never been. Oh, you've never been to Taquamanon Falls. So you're making fun of my mug. I'm allergic to fant- tourists. I'm allergic to tourists. So fantastic, yeah. most beautiful waterfalls in Michigan, and you've never been, and you're ripping me for my mug. So you have no idea how beautiful it is, and how like evocative it is, and how I, awesome it is. I've seen a couple of pictures. Evocative. Yes. When I see this mug, I just get all, you know, ev- evocated. I get ev- evocated. You're right, OG. I get evocated. Hmm. Cool. I've never been to, to uh, Falls either. You never been to Taquamanon Falls? You grew up in Michigan. You never been to Taquamanon Falls? Oh. It's not a rule. I'm good. <laughs> Just, I'm so disappointed. Guys, we're going to need your Michigan card back. We're going to have to deal. Gonna have to, call, gonna have to call it in. Gave mine back a while ago. I think ago. he's going to willingly hand that over. He's, he's already, he's like, if we talk about snow tires one more time. Talk about snow tires, anything snow, snowy. By the way, it's Funny like you should mention that, Joe. 75 degrees here today. I might play golf later. <laughs> we did just get snow last night. It's gorgeous. Good thing I got my snow tires. I will say, it makes you look quite svelte and handsome when I make you look tiny. Well, if you need to lose some weight, just have pneumonia for two weeks. <laughs> And uh, that's right. Yeah. You won't hear Angelo Poli talk about that. That's because it's a secret. That's because it's a secret. He doesn't want you to know. Yeah. I was, I was close to like, uh, I, I don't think that I'm going to make it, but I'm going to try to keep the train going. But I was close to uh, probably an 18 month low wow. <laughs> as of the other day. I was pretty happy with myself. I saw a 208 for the first time when I was downstate and I'm not sure how, cause I ate pretty well over the weekend when Scale we did was broken. football trip and and all of that. I well, lost weight at Disney, which is obviously unheard of. Right. Mostly because I because I walked five miles and then got the flu and laid on the couch and ate nothing but liquid IV for four days. <laughs> and then these last mm, two Where weeks, did they sell that? Adventureland? Liquid IV? Liquid IV? No. CVS. Got the speed pass for your sphincter, did yeah. you? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's right next to the Dole Whip. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I'm glad you guys think it's funny. It was only like, you know, I think I didn't figure it all out, but I'm guessing that I probably spent two grand or 1500 on not doing anything like between all the tickets that I didn't use. And, you know, you got to buy the magic pass or the genie plus and all the da, 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 da. So just went with them without you. Well, I wasn't going to make the kid like, sorry, dad can't go. You guys are too. sit here and watch TV with me. Yeah. Yeah. Went to the park every day. All day with the kids. Aren't there weekends, though, where you would pay two grand to do nothing? Yeah, but as Joe knows... Do we get to pay two grand not to go to Disney? We call the days that you don't work free days, and sometimes Joe knows that we sometimes are platinum free days, and uh, sometimes they've been tinfoil free days, and these were tinfoil free days. I've had 20 of them in a row, just fantastically tinfoil free days. We talked about that at Coach yesterday, that uh, free days are one thing, but rejuvenating free days are what you're really after. Yeah. And that there's, yeah, you get used to taking free days and all of a sudden you're working on a bunch of non-energizing that's just piled up. Might as well be a buffer day for your home life, you know? Yeah. First time I've talked to you in a long time where you sound normal. Yep. When we were doing the thing yesterday, Joe, to test, he wanted me to help him test out his whole setup and figure out what looks good. Yeah. That was one of the first things I said to him. I was like, wow, you sound a lot better than you did even yesterday. And within seconds, he was having a coffee. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it feels yeah. great. Probably why I've lost so much weight. Is I haven't drunk anything in like three weeks. <laughs> I think it's why I can't lose weight because I eat pretty good and I work out, but I, but I drink. Are there a lot of carbs or fat in red wine? I thought there were. It's just the sugar. Very few. Yeah, Angela's like all that sugar's horrible. It's just the sugar. He's like, go yeah. go to hard alcohol, have one. He's like, that's still not great advice. Your doctor will say, 
no, but I'm telling you if you're just right. concerned with weight loss and that's it. But anyway, the reason I was reading, you know, I got all these magazines that I get stuff from for the show. And, uh, I was reading through last night on the plane, the ARP magazine, and they were talking about things you think are healthy that aren't. And they talked about walking Doug specifically. Oh, you're kidding me. They're like, as people get older, they give up other types of workouts to walk. And they're like, but studies show that you need to do some type of weightlifting because of the fact that you lose muscle mass and walking is great, but that's like your baseline. And then you still have to work out on top of that, which is funny because Uh. me and my friends are, me and my friends are all going through the same thing. I'm like, Hey, I'm getting 7,000 steps. I'm good. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you're not good. It, nope, no. it's not good. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's better than doing nothing, but it's but it doesn't replace the workout that you really need to have. What about hiking? What does it say about hiking? Uh, it, it says extended walking walk. with more clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> I just said that to get get under his dander because whenever I say I'm hiking, he gets so pissed off. I don't get pissed off. I just if you don't have an M16 on your back, you are not hiking. You're not hiking. That's not hiking either. We're not talking about government sponsored hikes. Government sponsored hikes. To go meet new friends. (laughs) Give them the American salute.